recognizing the non-equalization of profit rates. I'm going to talk about the reason why I'm giving this talk, the methods I use, and the results. Now, what's the motivation? After my recent video on profit rates, the, the one I'm showing here, I got a couple of comments that I thought deserved a reply. One of them was, you've fallen for the classic blunder of confusing price with value. You just show a spreadsheet and say, oh, X went up, Y went down, but why? What's the mathematical relationship you claim is missing? Don't use a damn spreadsheet sheet use equations everything in this argument it has the characteristic of quantity use equations it's a model so i replied in a comment that i would present the model and i have a link to the model in the comments below the vi video or in the text below the video if you're looking at the pdf of my files the red word link gives a link to the full document. But since the description of the model and the math of the model run to some 18 pages, I'm only going to give a very brief summary here and a few of the results. So what's the method? My argument in the video and in the model is based on Marx's reproduction methodology in Capital Volume 2. And this, strictly speaking, is not a set of equations. It's a semi-formal description by Marx of a temporal process, a process that occurs in his account by a series of discrete steps. Now we know that it's a great oversimplification. He just has half a dozen discrete steps, whereas in the real economy there's millions of discrete steps occurring. But I'm sticking with his abstraction. As such, it's better modelled by a state machine or algorithm than by a set of simultaneous equations. Now, we know that temporal processes can, of course, be modelled by systems of differential equations, if they're supposed to be continuous processes, but that's not what Marx used. So my model is discrete steps modelled in a typed imperative language uh, because I think that fits best with Marx's um, account. Here's an excerpt of a page from the documentation of the model where I describe all the steps you have to go through. I give the maths that's got to be carried out and the text and the model are integrated using literate programming so that a single source file produces both the model results and a PDF article describing the model. In order to address the issue of whether I was confusing price with value, and to check that I was not confusing price with value, the model is written using a dimensional type system. The basis of the system of dimension types is given below here as persons, money and time. And this is analogous to the way in physics you might have the dimensions mass, distance and time. And when you've agreed on the basis set for the dimensions, you then need units of measurement. And in the model we use pounds for money, people for persons, weeks for time and person weeks for value. In many examples, people give person hours for value, but in the model I'm giving person weeks. And within the model, every variable is explicitly dimensioned to be one or other of these or some combination of these dimensions. And the type system of the formal language ensures that no mathematical operation can be carried out that would violate the dimensional integrity. So what results do we get? When you execute the model, you get a series of snapshot tables like this, which are analogous but more detailed, analogous to but more detailed than the tables you get in Capital Volume 2. 
They're modelled like the tables of Capital Volume 2, um, except if you look at the bottom line, you've got the V, C and S that you get in Capital Volume 2. You've also got Rho, which is the rate of profit, which is something you get in Capital Volume 3. And above that, I give the real resources. L for labour, means of production being consumed, unsold means of production in the hands of the capitalists of that industry and the relative price, P, the price compared to value, so that one is tracking the price to value deviations. The variables are all explained in the document. Because it's an executable model, not a spreadsheet, it can be run for many steps. So whereas, whereas in the previous talk, using a spreadsheet, I just gave two steps. In this case, I run for nine, eight or nine steps. So you can then get time series. This shows the time series for employment and output. This is employment. It stays at full employment for five time steps and then suddenly collapses. Now, why is that? Recall that Department 1 has a higher organic composition of capital. If you allow mobility of money capital between Department 1 and Department 2, the amount of money capital thrown into the process in Department 1 goes down each stage and that thrown into the process of Department 2 goes up each stage. As a result, production in Department 1 falls, production in Department 2 increases. So in the initial phase here, the blue line shows the decline in production in Department 1. The red, li red dotted line shows the rise in production in Department 2. So Department 1 shrinks, Department 2 rises, but it only rises for a limited period. Then it falls catastrophically as well. Now, why is that? For a limited period, it can rise because Department 2 is using previously unsold stocks of means of production produced by Department 1. As Department 1 shrinks, Department 1 itself is consuming less means of production and therefore leaves unsold stocks. And this, for a while allows Department 2 to expand. But beyond a certain point, the shrinkage of the production of means of production means that there's an absolute shortage of means of production and Department 2 also has to shrink its, its production because there's a shortage of inputs. At that point, unemployment or employment levels plummet because both industries are contracting. Now, what effect does that produce? Uh, I've explained that. What effect does that produce? Well, blue line is the wage share. As unemployment shoots up, the wage share of, of output falls. If we look at the prices of the different commodities, well, the excess unsold stocks of means of production in Department 1 cause an initial fall of prices. But then the absolute shortage of means of production cause a rapid increase in prices. And in Department um, 2, there is an increase in prices all along because of increased demand. The, why is there increased demand? Because Department 2 has a lower organic composition of capital, so more of the capital is laid out in variable capital, therefore there is a bigger demand for consumer goods, and therefore the price of commodities in Department 2 rises, whereas the price of commodities in Department 1 falls. This, of course, is exactly the opposite of what you're taught in textbook uh, economics if you happen to get a course which teaches Marxist economics or Ricardian economics. 
the, the standard Ricardian theory is that you should get a movement in the opposite direction. The Ricardian theory is that the industry with the highest organic composition of capital should experience a rise in prices after the capital movement occurs and the other one should experience a fall in prices. Now, that's not actually what happens. Now, you do get some equalisation of profit rates. Profit rates rise right from the start. Now, why is that? It's because the price of the elements of constant capital has fallen. And Marx gives a fall in the price of the elements of constant capital as something which will cause profit rates to rise. So you get an initial profit rate rising due to that reason in both industries. And this actually does produce some narrowing of the discrepancy between the profit rates because that improvement in the um, profitability will be most pronounced in the industry with the highest organic composition of capital. But then when the wage shear plummets, you get much more exploitation occurring and all profit rates go through the roof. So, in the initial phase, you have a surplus of unsold means of production and the price of means of production falls. As I say, that's exactly the opposite of what the theory says. Later on, you get an inflationary rise in all prices because the same amount of money, same amount of money capital in the system is chasing a declining amount of output. So that boosts money profits. Apparent profits go up because of the rise in prices between the start of the production period and the end of the production period. As time progresses, the output of all industries falls, but with the same amount of money chasing fewer commodities, prices rise. And capitalists are in a fool's paradise. Apparently booming paper profits whilst the real economy declines. It sounds familiar. It's arguably what has happened, or be much more gradually, in countries like the UK and the US, after neoliberal reforms prioritise capital mobility above all else. Think of what's been in the news about Thames Water. Highly capital-intensive industry, the water supply. Masses of capital employed relatively few workers. So, what do the capitalists do? They pull their money, once it was privatised, they pull their money out of Thames Water. Pay it out as dividends. Fail to reinvest. In fact, they do even worse than that. They borrow against the fixed capital and pay the money they have borrowed out as dividends, effectively consuming the seed corn. And now Thames Water is going to go bankrupt. We have seen this happening in Britain and America, the systematic rundown of those industries which have high organic composition of capital and which produce means of production. Historically, the same thing obviously happened in famines. When the real economy contracted, but the upper classes did well, because high prices enabled them to profiteer on the sale of the limited stocks of grain that there were. So what I'm saying is, although it's a simple model, it does reproduce things we actually observe when the neoliberal principle of the omnipotence of capital mobility is put into practice.